This is Gardening in America, and I'm Ed Hume. Today we're in Maltby, Washington. We're at Walster Way Iris Gardens, and I'm with the owner, Fran Walster. Uh, Fran, whereabouts is uh, Walster Way Iris Gardens? We're in Maltby, and we're probably located about six miles east of Woodenville. Yeah, that beautiful. The iris are just outstanding. Thank you. How, how many different varieties do you grow? Uh, tall bearded, we have over 600 varieties, and then we also have Japanese and Siberian. Oh, wow, so a good selection. Mm -hmm. uh, for our viewers' sake, uh, tell us a little bit about these iris. When is the time of the year that they bloom? They bloom here in uh, late May uh, to probably the middle of June, and then the Japanese carry on in June, and then they're done blooming by the end of June. They are. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were to pick these, are these a good cut flower, first of all? I think so. Uh, a lot of people don't like it, but it matters how warm your house is. I see. And how long would they last as a cut flower? If you keep your house cool, I'd say probably five days. Well, that's not bad mm -hmm. at all. Is there any way to prolong the blooming of them? Well, you would pick off the dead ones and then the other uh, buds will open and then I think you should probably change the water every other day. Okay. You know. Yeah, that type of thing. Much as you would do with most any flower, right. probably, as a cut flower. Tell us a little bit about growing iris. Uh, do they need sun? They're really an easy plant to grow. Uh, they need full sun. They prefer full sun. Uh, I'm talking about Washington because we don't sure. get a lot of it. Um, they need good drainage. They don't like wet feet at all. And they need to be not more than half an inch deep. If they get too deep, they'll just have green leaves. They won't bloom at all. Yeah, that's one of the major problems, isn't mm -hmm. it, with people planting them too deep or maybe mulching afterwards and then they're too deep. You know, if we're going to get 20 degrees or lower, I'd say you can mulch them in the winter, but you need to take that off. And I tell them never to ground cover, never to bark them, because they like the heat on the rhizomes. Okay. It doesn't make any difference if the rhizome is planted north, south, east, or west, or is that even I'll probably factor? get in trouble with this, but I'm going to say no. <laughs> okay, yeah. I don't think it does either, but uh -huh. very often people ask that. Right. And a specialist like you, I thought I should ask and, and uh, just maybe <laughs> solve some of the questions that we get. The other thing, of what about transplanting iris? When When's the best time to transplant them? The best time is mid-July through, I'd say, Labor Day, even into the middle of September. The key is to, when they order them, they get them, they let them stay in the garage or something until September, and you need to plant them right away. I think it assures better bloom. Yeah, and you have a catalog and a price list, just so our viewers will know, and, and your telephone number will show up in the right. credits of the program. Thanks very much for Thank sharing you. these beautiful iris and the care of the iris. They're a great plant to use in the garden, and as Fran says, a beautiful plant to use in full bright sun, and they're very, very easy to grow. So a great plant for the garden, the iris. Almost every garden has a shady spot, and one of the great perennials to use in the shady garden are the gorgeous hostas. You know, they're primarily known for their beautiful foliage, but you can see almost all of these are sending up flower spikes now. They're commonly called the plantain lily, and it's a lily-like flower, quite small, and several on a stem. Uh, some of them are very, very fragrant. But look at the different foliage colors in here. Now, I try not to make it a policy to, to mention varieties when it comes to some of these plants because you may not be able to find them. And there are so many different varieties. When you go to your local nursery or garden center to select them, you may find varieties that you like a lot better than the ones that I'm showing you. But just to give you an idea of some of the different variegations, you can see here cream color, yellow in that foliage, uh, bright green, and almost a gray uh, green here really varies considerably and the leaf texture varies considerably too but makes some great plants for the shaded garden. So it's what I want to do here. Actually those are kind of grouped a little bit too close together and the reason for that is when we expanded this area I had to move a couple of them. So this fall I'll dig and transplant them and that's the best time to transplant hostas in oh like September, October, November, December, January, or February. But to actually plant them, you can select them at the nurseries and the garden centers now. And this is a variety called August Moon. And you can, as you can see by the foliage, it's a pretty small variety. On the other hand, over here, 
is a variety called uh, Seboldi uh, elegans, and look at the foliage on it. It's considerably larger. Look at the beautiful flower. There's what I'm talking about when I say the lily-like flowers, the plant and lily. And then this one that I'm actually going to plant here is a variety called Tierra. How do you plant them? Very simple. Let's dig a hole here. This is a low variety, and this is a great place because it's very, very shady. I have very good soil here. But is what I'm going to do as well, as I always tell you, mix organic humus, some peat moss, some processed manure into the planting soil, mix it around with that existing soil, and then we'll take a little bit and spread along the edge here too, so that as we pull that soil in, it has some good uh, organic matter in around the, the root ball too. So we'll take it out, massage the roots just a little, and plant it right at ground level. Whoops, there we go. Right there, face forward, so you see the best side of it. And then I'm going to put the tag right here in the back so I know what the variety is. They're beautiful hostas, and for the shade, it's a great plant. Now's a good time to select and plant them. It's always a lot of fun to develop a new area in the landscape, and there was a large rhododendron here, so you couldn't really get around either side of it and then lawn beyond. So I'm developing this into a flower garden for Myrna. And it's what I had to do because the rhododendron was so large, I had to take out four pieces of turf here to get the root ball. And so I've just placed them in and I will dress up this area next. You'll also notice that I'm using the edge stone and I'll carry that out for this entire lawn area. But I've also used it on both sides of the walkway and then the gravel in between. So that keeps the gravel within bounds so it's not always going into the flower and shrub beds. And then let me show you down below here. You'll notice that the pathway uh, falls off pretty rapidly. And you'll notice that I ended up down here rather than to start. Normally you'd start and work up, but I wanted to flange this end out. So I started so it would end up right up at the other end and coming back. But let me show you quickly how this is done. You'll notice I'm using the edge stone here along this lower lawn area too, uh, because it's so easy to run the wheel of the lawnmower on that and, and really make it look nice. So is what we do is take wet sand and kind of lay it out here first. And if we do that, oops, I need a little bit more there. And then just place the, these edge stones right on the wet sand like to tamp it down a little bit. Get the second one in there. That one needs a little bit of lifting on this. There we go. And then the third one, whoops, we need some sand in there, don't we? And uh, this is such an easy process. Boy, it's... And then last but not least, we've got the last one here. And all we need to do is to place it in place. Look at that, that easy, and it fit, comes together beautifully, doesn't it? Then all I need to do is to add the gravel. And I've got a rake there, but instead is all I'll do is just level this off by hand. And look there, a little sweeping and we've got the job done. And is what I'm going to do then is to plant on both sides of the walk here, some perennials and some annuals for flowers so that Myrna will have them as cut flowers. And then I'm hoping the annuals and the flowers will grow over the edge a little bit to soften it. And then that'll give it that fine finished appearance. <music> We're on Maury Island in the state of Washington, and I'm with our hardscape specialist, Darcy Beck. We were here last fall, and Darcy invited us back when he got this project underway. 
How did you come about designing the garden in this fashion, Darcy? Well, the owner wanted to take her vegetable garden and make it a little bit more unique other than just a straight uh, rectangular type of a shape. She wanted to have raised beds because they're easier to maintain. And so that's why we came up with this design. Yeah, it's great. And the material looks kind of unique and new too. It is, it's a brand new product from Mutual Materials and it's called Roman Stack Stone. What makes it unique is it's tapered shape like this uh, for ease of making, you know, going around corners. Oh, and, wow. and, uh, and then it's also finished on either side so you can use the stone either way oh, wow. and uh, create really unique designs. It's very easy to use, very easy to work with. It looks like it'd be easy. And, and then, of course, it stacks and locks together. Too, stacks and it? locks together. All right. How high can you make the wall? Well, in this particular case, and uh, uh, primarily the product is used for small uh, retaining walls and for, like we're doing here, raised flower beds and to a maximum of two feet in height. Okay. So I noticed in the back here you have about four high in fact. Exactly. Uh, what's the steps in the project in putting this together? The first thing that you want to do and what we've done is we took the uh, original uh, rectangular shape and created the design and, um, and then we, we took spray paint and marked off where the beds were going to oh, go Okay. and then dug out the paths use the material from the paths to create the material for the raised for the beds. raised beds yeah. so we didn't have to bring in a lot of extra material sure then the next step is to bring in the uh, gravel level it compact it and create the base for the stone to sit on and once you've got the base for the stone to sit on then you're all ready to, to lay the wall that and sounds really it's easy. pretty easy pretty yeah. basic Tell me, this is capped then with a different type of stone or the, the same yeah, type? Then or? the stone that, that, that caps it is, is essentially the same stone without this groove, this, this the part The ridge on top. across the top. Right. Oh, that that yeah. finishes it off. You know, it has, I would say for a new stone, it has kind of a rustic look to it. Yeah, it has a kind of a chiseled, old world look to it. Very, very soft and enduring. And the beauty of it is, you know, you could use it as a retaining wall in addition, of course, to the, the raised beds. Absolutely. Yeah, I think this is going to be a great idea for me to use in my own garden as well. Thanks very much, Darcy. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful idea to have raised vegetable gardens in this fashion. Yeah. Really nice. <music>
Remember, it's always easiest to open the packet at the bottom of the packet. And again, is what I'll do is back in here, particularly where you can see it, is I'll weed the area and then I'm just going to take a few carrots. And these are much smaller seeds, so they're a little bit more difficult to spread. But let's just spread them like so. And again, they'll need to be thinned but then just cover over a little bit with new fresh soil, like so. And that's all there is to it. Boy, you can utilize every bit of space in the vegetable garden. And now's a great time to plant out those vegetables. One of my favorite plants is the plant of the week this week. It's the beautiful Ceanothus, just coming into bloom. And you know, that's why I like it so much, is because after the spring flowering plants are through and before the summer flowering plants come on, the beautiful Ceanothus comes into bloom. And there are many, many different varieties. Uh, this is one that's going to get quite a bit taller than this. In fact, it'll get probably about eight to 10 feet tall. However, I will keep it cut down. Now, Ceanothus is evergreen, and it's indigenous to Southern Oregon and Northern California, and it grows on the mountainsides, and it, that indicates good drainage, and that's very important in the home garden that you give the plant good drainage. It is evergreen. Some varieties, as I say, will get 20 feet tall. Some are very, very low, will get less than a foot in height. So they're really nice. But by the way, this plant here that I bought in the nursery just this past week is the exact size that this plant was two years ago. So some of the varieties are fairly fast growing and you might want to keep that in mind. Some varieties, by the way, have much deeper uh, flowers, deep bright blue, in fact, just outstanding. Now the next plant, these three plants here are delphiniums, one of my favorite of all the perennials. And usually they'll grow about four feet tall. Some are a little bit dwarfer. Some will grow the Pacific hybrids, for example, sometimes six to eight feet tall. And they come in a wide range of colors. And they too bloom during that period when not much is in bloom between the spring and the summer. And look at this. I just found this at the nursery the other day. And this is one of the mini firefly impatience. Really unusual, isn't it? And uh, this is, of course, grown in a container. It'll only grow about eight to 10 inches tall. So they're very, very low plants. Uh, excellent for containers, bedding, and borders. These flowering plants are my choices and they're available at your local nursery or garden center. We're just outside of Spokane, Washington, and I'm with special guest, Phyllis Stevens. Phyllis, you've been in the industry for quite some time. Tell us a little bit about your involvement well, in the I'm industry. Well, I'm kind of like you. I kind of have my hands in all kinds of things. I do a little garden segment uh, for KXLY on the television itself. I also have a radio program for KXLY 920, and it runs two hours. I answer garden questions all those two hours it's oh, a lot wow. of fun yeah. and I also write a garden column for our local newspaper and that's a once a week thing too so kind of have the hands in all kinds of stuff trying to get the word out how wonderful gardening is yeah and I can see you practice what you preach because of the beautiful <laughs> garden Thank and this you. by the way is Phyllis's garden that we're standing in uh, tell us uh, because we're in Spokane mm -hmm. it can be a little bit hot during the summer and right. really cold during the winter do you have any special tips for our viewers just to make sure that they actually buy plant material that is going to be hard enough for our region. We are in zone 5, which means we're going to go down to minus 20 degrees, or we oh, could yeah. go down to minus 20. Always try to buy plants through reputable nurseries, because then we can make sure that they have been grown in a northern climate. Sure. That's really important. I think that's the main thing. And then, of course, there's all that stuff, keep things watered and mulch them in, in the wintertime, all those good things that we have to watch for our area. Oh, yeah, I, I imagine. Uh, tell us also, what have you got here? as features in the garden. This looks like about a hundred feet of perennial border alone. Oh, aren't I awful? No, I just love perennials. Beautiful. I just think they're wonderful. But because they kind of go 
in and out so quickly. I always add the annuals because sure. the annuals keep the color. And you have to have water in a garden. Don't sure. you just have to have that sound? It's just fabulous. And your waterfall is beautiful. Oh, and I love some shade gardens. You know, originally this was a flat land and we started building trees or putting in trees, I should say. And all of a sudden we have all this shade. So what do you do? You have to take out the sun-loving plants and now we have the shade plants so I get to grow the hostas and still bees. Oh, it's wonderful. When you choose plants at a nursery or garden center, do you look for any special thing in choosing a plant? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's like a sickness in the spring. Oh, do I have this one? Do I have that one? No. And then I bring them home and I have no place to put them yet, but I'll find a home. Uh, that's what I tell people not to do though. Always exactly. plan first, right? And then put them, but not me. No, I, I don't plan. <laughs> how much maintenance and who maintains the garden? How many gardeners do you have? <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at the gardener and my husband, oh bless his heart, he loves to golf and so he puts up with me, but he helps me. Oh, I could never do it by myself. But So there's just two of us. Thanks, Phyllis. That's all the time we have today. Hope you can join me at the same time next time for Gardening in America. And remember, our relationship with the planet today is tomorrow's future. Have a great week. Thank mm -hmm. you.